You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more information about the variety of topics covered on this show, as well as my other podcast, How to Stan, visit 17karatkpop.weebly.com. And if you enjoy this episode, please consider becoming a monthly donor to support my work and allow it to continue to go on and be free for all to access for as low as 99 cents a month. Visit the Support the Show link on my site's homepage for more information. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to 17 Karat K-Pop. Today's special guest goes by H. Kenneth. He's an original singer and songwriter, and he also writes and produces for artists who have been from Germany, Italy, South Korea, Spain, all over the world. He worked on My Treasure by the K-Pop group Treasure, And what I am most excited about, of course, the new title track for Seventeen's new album, Ready to Love. Lots of interesting experiences that I'm excited to hear about. So my first question is a broad question I like to start all my interviews with, which is just hearing a little bit about your story. For people who don't know it, how you got into the world of songwriting, producing, etc. Just how, what has your journey been like to get to where you are? I guess I started listening to music just like anybody else when I was super early. I guess I noticed uh, I was really into like melodies and just sort of um, the general feeling of some of the songs my mom would listen to, like old school, uh, classic oldies, um, like uh, Otis Redding and um, Marvin Gaye and all those those great old classic crooners. And um, th- th- my actual journey into sort of um, beginning to want to be like a musician started when I was about 10 years old. I was actually, this is going to sound crazy. I was watching a, um, a Garth Brooks uh, concert on HBO live. It was live in central park and uh, it just blew my mind. And, and I guess it was sort of the energy he had on stage and um, just, it looked like he was just having a blast. So that was what uh, got me sort of on the path. I, I loved it. And I sort of asked for my parents for a guitar for my birthday. And they, they gave me the, the cheapest, most beat up thing <laughs> you can imagine. Because, you know, like parents don't know if their kids are going to actually stick with things. And mm-hmm. so they didn't want to spend, yeah. you know, a bunch of money on it. So I got the guitar and, um, you know, all throughout high school, I kind of loved alternative, punk, pop punk, emo. Um, ended up going to college for, uh, I studied uh, vocal uh, performance and I uh, it was actually an emphasis on jazz so I've kind of run the gamut of like styles and genres just because I love like I said I love music I don't necessarily you know ha- haven't ever really said like oh I just like this genre or, or I don't listen to this genre um, it's been a pretty broad appreciation from from an early uh, conception so I guess after after college I got the degree in vocal performance and I kind of jumped in a van with some friends and we started touring the country and playing concerts and like that stuff that I was writing for that uh, it was sort of where I started initially kind of really creating songs um, from a writer standpoint and and an artist standpoint we play shows and we tour we put out records and uh, it was kind of more of a pop punk emo thing you know warp tour I don't know if you're familiar with the warp tour but mm-hmm. we were like in that lane so uh, when I was about 25, I switched gears. I guess I kind of aged out of that sort of um, uh, what would you call it? Like a like a cosplay sort of. I guess that's kind of phase. A, yeah, yeah. Um, but I kind of just realized, you know, playing shows in a rock band. You know, it, I'd had a blast doing it, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do forever. And so I kind of went back home after one of our tours um, and looked at what I really enjoyed. Um, and what I wanted to do for the duration of my career, which was actually songwriting. And so I started to really look at what was working in the music world. This was, I guess, 2011, 2012, 13, maybe, um, ages ago. But, uh, (laughs) I, um, I started to notice there was like a, a big influx of indie alternative pop music in TV and film and ads and media just across the board. And I love that genre, uh, just like anything else. And so I sort of, and it was the most familiar, I guess, to me in, in the writing standpoint. And so I started writing stuff that I thought could work for for those things, TV ads and things. And um, I ended up getting into, uh, you know, a lane of, of making an income from that for a little while. But I mean, obviously, you know, that was kind of a means to an end. You know, it's sort of like, I hate to put it this way, but when, when you're early on like that, it was sort of like the flipping burgers of of music, you know, writing. 
Right, work your way up. Yeah, exactly. And it was just kind of like an income source. And I was able to make sense of it and kind of figure out the puzzle. And so, but it wasn't, one of, again, what I wanted to do forever. I, I want to write songs. I want to write artistic things that people can grab onto and really appreciate and love. And so I just used that as a vehicle to start writing with artists and, um, you know, creating, kind of producing more. I was, again, mostly a songwriter at the time. And I kind of started to dabble in like, making the sounds and trying to replicate drums and, and synths and piano sounds and stuff. But at my core, I've always been a vocalist. So getting to the, the now of our conversation, all of those things um, kind of came together in the, in the most perfectly timed way in about 2018 when I st- discovered uh, K-pop. Um, and I was just, I was just enthralled with, with this, this genre because it was, almost a, a combination of everything you know there's there's a little bit of everything in in every k-pop song and um being a vocalist by trade i was just blown away by these arrangements and these melodies and these harmonies and um the incredible skill of of these artists and so i just dove in i was i just was all about it i i kind of like i kind of didn't think about anything else for a little while i started to try writing it i kind of started working with a couple of different producers and i met my now my main collaborator christopher Samelius, um out in la i was at the for a writing trip and um we connected and he kind of he kind of heard my story a little bit and and kind of believed in some of what i was doing and kind of um you know he had already had a lot of success in the genre he's from he's from denmark but we just kind of clicked and so he and i have been collaborating uh just you know basically weekly uh, at least a few times a month uh for for a few years now and we've got just a dozens and dozens of great k-pop songs and and demos bouncing around it sounds like then you were kind of building up your resume in a way and really like getting all these skills that actually helped you become helping lead to where you are now in a way sure yeah definitely yeah that's what being around all of the you know incredible talent is here you know a big focus of nashville obviously it's big it's called music city for a reason but a big Mm -hmm thing that people sort of maybe don't don't really realize is that Nashville's is like a song first town. I mean, it's almost like production is secondary to the song. And and so that's been the soul of my functionality when I go into a writing room is let's make a really great song before we even think about what the drums are going to sound like, before we even think about, you know, what the synth is going to sound like, all that stuff. Um, so being around these people here in Nashville, these incredible artists and skilled people has kind of helped to develop that songwriting skill. So I'm originally from, um, I was born in Texas, but I did most of my growing up in Wyoming, which is super random for some people. I've been in Nashville for about 13 years. I moved here in 2008. Did you move there by, um, if I may ask, for the songwriting for your career? At the time, no. I, I actually was, um, my sister lived here at the time. And, um, you know, there was sort of this, Again, my life is full of random, perfectly timed things. Um, you know, she had kind of been here and had a roommate and, and they had kind of a falling out and she needed a little bit of help out here. And I was I was kicking around in the Northwest. I wasn't doing much. And I was like, you know what, out, I'll hang out. Um, we can we can kind of get on the same page and, and help each other out for a little bit. And obviously, when I you know, when I got on the ground out here, I wasn't, you know, thinking immediately like, let's I want to be a songwriter forever. It was, you know let me see if I can start a band, you know, let me see how this goes. And in 2008, I mean, think about (laughs) pop music and how much it's changed just in the last decade. This was 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. And and I was sort of like a fish out of water because, you know, there wasn't a lot of pop music at all happening in Nashville. And so I sort of was um, able to ride the wave from the moment it sort of started to build. And, um, a lot of luck, a lot of kind of really hard work and meeting the right people. Um, so over 13 years, that's like as of this week, you know, having this sort of sort of amazing thing happening with 17 has been it's kind of a journey. It's a long one, but it's um, it's pretty crazy. Nashville, I've never been there. So I guess maybe I believe the stereotype before, too. But it feels like that gets associated with being like a huge country music hub and like all about country music. I guess I was just curious because um, the other songwriters I've talked to in the K-pop and pop worlds, it seems like a lot of them felt like they needed to relocate to like L.A. or something. I mean, yeah, historically, you know, Nashville's country. I mean, it's home of like the Country Music Hall of Fame and the Ryman and 
um, uh, you know, all these incredible country records are made two miles from my house. You know, it's it's country city, you know. Yeah, no, it, look, I'll be honest. You know, I love this town. I love all the people that are in my network and all of my friends. And, and I would never speak ill of Nashville at all. Um, but it is incredibly difficult to be taken seriously um, in Nashville as a pop writer. Um, and especially as a K-pop writer. I mean, it's like... Unheard of. Yeah, to walk into a, a, a room or an office on Music Row where all these labels and publishers are and show them some demos of, of <laughs> some of that stuff, they... Like they're just bewildered. They're like, I don't, I don't get it. You mm -hmm. know, some of them do, some of them get it. Some of them are ahead of the curve a little bit, but, but overall, mostly it's like, what are you doing here? It's, it's confusing. So, you know, for me to have any level of movement and success, look, I'll be honest, a lot of it has come through LA. Chris is, Christopher, my, my uh, collaborator, he's located in LA. Um, a lot of the successes I'm having in the dance and EDM world are Germany and, and the Netherlands. And it's not really necessarily coming from, you know, collaborating in Nashville and, and it's, yeah, but I love it here. You know, I love living here. Um, but, but LA is a frequent, uh, stop of mine for, for collaborations. I'm actually heading out there. Like I'm leaving in 48 hours to fly out there for a few weeks. So you do feel like maybe it'd be easier to be in LA, but you, Nashville's kind of your home. Yeah. I think I'll always have roots here. I do write again. I, you know, I'm a songwriter. I'm not necessarily a K-pop songwriter. I'm not necessarily a country songwriter. I'm a songwriter. Mm -hmm. and, I sometimes when I'm sitting alone, you know, at 7 p.m. on a Thursday and I had this idea for a song on an acoustic guitar, I'll sit down, I'll write it. I've got thousands of songs, literally. And, wow. and some of them are countries. The cool thing about Nashville that is, I think, one of my favorite things is being able to go out to these these little clubs and, and bars and play writers rounds, which, you know, you share the stage with three or four other people that are great songwriters and you just play on guitar and, and uh, piano. You share your songs. And that's my favorite thing about Nashville in the in the um, in the sense of of musicality, um, but but certainly L.A. is is like aside from Stockholm, Sweden is L.A. is the American sort of pop hub. You've worked on like over eighty ads, is it for movies, shows, and things like that? Yeah, that was sort of my my bread and butter. I've I've probably I've reached probably about more like two hundred. What was your first experience like in that? How did that even? come about as an opportunity you know it wasn't random I, I like I said I I really after my my old band sort of did its thing and we had the ride when I got home from that tour I was sort of tired I was broke I was you know looking at again what I wanted to do forever and the first thing I noticed was the tv and film element and how people could make money getting their songs into shows and ads and I studied how that music worked how it sounded and I figured out what people were placing those songs and so I, you know, I was in specifically in, in that lane um, for, for a little while. And my first experiences were, you know, the learning curve is, is huge because it's not just, you know, let me write a song about dogs. You know, it's literally like, you know, let's write a song about dogs without saying the word dogs. And let's make it sound like Imagine Dragons, you know, or or the White Stripes. That sort of is like how that world works a little bit. Um, it's, it's really influence based. And so. Again, coming from my background of like a little bit of everything, I was able to kind of make sense of it and have a, have a good time doing it. It was a super fun puzzle to figure out. Since you've dabbled in all these different genres and activities and stuff, do you tend to, I mean, is there a certain, maybe logistically or maybe just mentally, a different like process, a different mindset? Like you focus on working on writing for a commercial and then you focus on working on a K-pop song or like, do you tend to work on everything kind of at once or do you sort of just mentally totally shift and focus one at a time on all these specific things you're working on? Like, do you tap into kind of, I guess, a different creative process depending on one of the many hats you wear? Definitely. I mean, kind of, kind of, yes, to all of that. Um, there is a little bit of everything going on all the time. You know, I get asked to write with, um, with people who are on, publishing a cup uh, publishing deals or record deals you know i'm not signed i'm i'm completely independent i have a great manager um and i have a great lawyer and all these these wonderful people that are on my team um you know but i'm not signed to a publisher or a label and so we've kind of got to go out and find these opportunities and we got to go out and sort of kind of you know track down this these things but I, again i've kind of figured out the puzzle on the sync stuff i figured out the puzzle on the k-pop stuff um, and, and I'm always constantly trying to figure out the puzzle on the actual song itself, because like, that's a constantly evolving lane. But 
yeah, I'm kind of like right now I've got a bunch of songs as a producer. I have a bunch of songs I've got to finish. Sync Lane, you know, that stuff is a little bit less urgent, um, you know, as as a, a good sync song is going to be a good sync song for, you know, a few years, hopefully. But uh, yeah, right now, uh, I guess my I guess my method, I guess, is as an independent and, and sort of freelance writer is I start chasing the, the fires that are burning the hottest uh, in a way. And whatever is sort of coming to me more frequently or creating the most buzz and movement in my career, I sort of will set down or, or set aside some of the other things that are less urgent and say like, okay, I really am having a good time doing this and it's working. Like the K-pop stuff is not only is it one of my favorite things, but the reason we're talking right now is because it's working. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to LA to track down some more K-pop sessions and, and ha hopefully have some more great collaborations that can lead to more great cuts with great artists. Um, that's, that's my main focus right now. Um, but the other stuff won't stop, you know, it'll just be like, oh, okay, there's nothing to work on this week for, for K-pop, so I'll work on some of those sync songs. Do you ever see yourself being signed to a label, or do you prefer this independent route? Independent routes work so far. Um, yeah. You know? <laughs> I think there are pros and cons to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's a pro, a pro on, on, in terms of being unsigned, the biggest pro for me is uh, I'm retaining ownership of everything I'm making, which is one of the most valuable things that any writer can can have. Um, I've I've worked a long time and very very hard to get really good at what I'm doing, so that every opportunity that shows up, I can deliver the best possible product. Um, and because of that, more and bigger opportunities are showing up. But the con of that, like I said, is I, I have to find collaborators that have resources to pitch the songs. And um, you know, having a label and a publisher is massive because i can i can like many other writers i can write a song by myself you know in my in my studio alone um if i had a publisher that that knew what i was doing and knew what i was best at um i could hand those songs to them and say go to town i think it would you know this song would work great for ariana this song would work great for uh justin bieber you know like i could say that and they would move it um yeah that's that's definitely something that i that would be great but it's dependent upon the situation the deal the numbers, you know, it's it's that's a music industry uh, decision. Switching gears a little bit, uh, I'd love to hear more about the song we've been mentioning, which is how the new Seventeen song "Ready to Love" came together. Because I was looking at the song credits, and it has three Seventeen members on there, and it's got a bunch of other writers. It's just how on earth did that happen? It feels like everyone contributed to that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was like it's the definition of a collaboration. Um, you know, the way that it worked on an actual kind of functional level was my my buddy Christopher called me. He does this from time to time. He'll call and say, hey, you know, I heard that this artist is looking for songs uh, or I just got this cool track from a producer I work with and they're looking for some top lines and some lyrics and melodies. And we'll talk about it. And, you know, we'll say, like, what's the likelihood that we'll get the cut? What's, you know, what's the level of the artist? Do we like the track? Can we deliver something good? Because if we don't think we can do a good job, we're not going to, we're not even gonna try it because we wanna give our best, um, put our best, best foot forward. So he called me and said, hey man, I got this cool track. Um, they're looking for something for, um, that could work for 17 specifically. And um, this was about, I guess, two and a half, maybe three months ago, it wasn't a long time ago. It was, it, this was a quick move on this, um, on this record. And um, we worked on the song for, for a couple of days, wrote you know, lyrics and melodies and, and all the things did vocal arrangements for different parts. I study, you know, I, I like to study the vocalists um, and, and look at what each of the singers and, and artists do in their group so that we can write parts for each of them. Um, mm -hmm. So so we did that with this one. And, you know, about three or four weeks ago, we got uh, the call that it made the record. And it was sort of like, oh, OK, you know, but we don't know the context and all that stuff. So what they do is, you know, they've had a couple other top liners try it. You know what I mean? Like they'll have other people write parts and pieces to see if what they do is better or or whatever. And then they sort of in in the kindest, most interesting way possible, they kind of Frankensteined, you know, this great song. And and the ending of the collaboration is when it gets to the guys and they say, OK, I like this melody. I want to change this. I want to change that. And And the 17 guys are incredibly talented and they love to be involved with every every record so they take the all the pieces and they say this is how we're gonna put this together and then they'll write their own pieces so that's kind of how you know you end up with this whatever 10 <laughs> eight or ten different writers on the song 
that sounds like the biggest mammoth task there is actually finding a way to write lines for all these different members, especially when you're talking about a group with 13 members. Again, it's a technique that I employ for my method and not everybody does that. Not everybody has to do that. Um, I just like to look at, at the people that are going to be singing the song. If the song is successful, they might be singing the song for the rest of their career. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I am getting as close to the character of what they are and what the, what the soul of that artist is because I want them to hear something in it that works for them and that they know the fans will love. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's one thing to sit down and say, Oh, we're just going to write a good pop song today. Um, but, but to be intentional, that's what's worked for me. Right. And it does sound like it's the kind of song that is 17. It's very much not just like any artist could sing this and it makes sense. We were aiming for we wanted it to be we wanted it to be a trademark song and mm -hmm. you know as of this week it's the lead single off of their eighth record <laughs> yeah it sounds like the song was all put together and then the 17 members contributed to this song or at least listed on the writing credits like decided to tweak stuff later yeah. on and that's how it came together i think yeah i mean the, you know in, in sometimes songs are created in a room with all the artists and the producers and the writers and they're made in one day and everybody says, this is it, this is perfect. And it makes its way all the way to the radio um, from that first day. But again, that's an anomaly. There will be changes, there'll be adjustments. You know, the label may say, ah, we don't know if this works. You know, um, one of the guys might hit the studio and they, maybe they've written a part that's not quite right for the, for the, the vocal performance, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, they'll make last minute changes all the time. Everybody does, every artist does. The final product, did it kind of sound like what you had in mind or did it kind of turn into something over time that was, I mean, I guess that might be the way with every song. It, like your initial ideas are not at all what it sounds like on the final demo. I love this question. I love this because that's actually one of the most interesting things to me because, you know, when I started looking at K-pop and studying how it worked and how, you know, incredible these artists are in, in skill and talent, um, I really was curious about like, again, how much do they play a role in those melodies and how much do the songs change from, you know, here's our demo idea to, oh, the record's out. And we heard, you know, we heard the, a rough mix of it, you know, a few weeks ago. And, and I was kind of, you know, I listened, I listened to the, the their version of that. I listened back to our demo, you know, cause you know, Chris and I are writing a ton of songs all the time. So I, sometimes I will forget about songs. Mm -hmm. And so, it was really interesting to me. Um, I'll compare this to another release that you already talked about, which was the Treasure song, that um, My Treasure, that, again, Chris, Christopher, and I uh, collaborated on. So My Treasure was probably about 90 95% um, the exact melodic footprint and arrangement that we had put together. They had changed, you know, a couple of raps. They had they had kind of changed a couple of melody, post melodies, things like that. You know, again, and they're and, you know, when I'm writing, I'm writing in English, and they obviously they speak some English, but they like to they prefer to sing mostly in their native language. And there's a lot more syllables to Korean than there are to English, and so they'll have to change things that, things now and then. But but so my treasure was basically a pretty accurate footprint of what we wrote melodically. This one, they kind of took I, I like to say that you can kind of hear like the dna of what of what christopher and i ha, ha, had put on the original like a lot of the hook like the chorus um is pretty much what we wrote i mean it's it's adjusted here and there they kind of did their own things with the verses they kind of did their own thing with the rap um the arrangement did change they actually shortened the song i think because they wanted to hit radio they wanted to try for they're pushing for america you know they're trying to come over here and make it make some some moves and so shorter songs concise songs that's kind of the move so the arrangement changed, and again, they used a lot of what we wrote for the hook. Um, but it, funny enough, the song that we wrote, the lyric and title of, of what we wrote to the track, was actually called "Fresh Out of Love," and it was oh, interesting. Actually, about um, lyrically about a, um, a breakup from from somebody that you are in love with, and you know you didn't want to go through the breakup, and you're still hoping that they'll come back. Um, so that was what we had originally written. And these guys, you know, obviously the record, the theme of this record, um, your choice is love. And they really kind of, obviously it's called ready to love now. And, and it's about being just about going into a new relationship rather than coming out. So it completely flipped, you know, the, the whole lyrical 
context that we had written, which is great. I love that. Yeah, it really does tie into their whole discography to change it, actually, because their whole story has kind of been about uh, emotionally maturing so that they feel ready to love. So now the song really is like the perfect finishing touch. Is it more common that it's like that as opposed to the treasure song? Like more often it's way different than the original or more often it's pretty much untouched. I have a feeling it's the former, but. Again, in my experience, I, I don't have a ton of cuts, you know, I, I've only got a few. Obviously there's more to come hopefully, but it's, it varies. I mean, I think a lot of like a lot of the stuff that Chris has done, a lot of that stuff ends up pretty much exactly as they make it. They're really skilled. You know, a lot of these guys, these producers and these creators are really skilled. And so they kind of just know where to hit it, um, which is again, what I'm learning, but I don't know. I, I don't have a great answer to that. I think it's sort of, again, it varies. It's varies from record to record uh, from, from the lyrical standpoint, obviously meaning and context and topics will pretty frequently change. Like the, my treasure song was when we wrote that, it was actually called your friends. And that song was about being in a relationship with somebody who, um, whose friends don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a big change. And trying to win them over, you know, trying to win over their affection and be like, I'm, you know, I really actually love your friend. Like I'm into this and, and, and I'm going to be in it for the long haul. I hope you guys come around. And, um, the, you know, obviously the, the topic now of that song, My Treasure, is, is actually hope. You know, it's mm -hmm. about feeling good and feeling okay and knowing everything's going to be all right because of the past year, year and a half of this whole pandemic, you know, and um, they came out of that with this with this song about hope um with with our melodic footprint which was one of my favorite things again i love when they make it their own but i also love when they make it something that is so touching that's a good way to look at it because i always wonder with songwriters who also write their own songs if they ever have that regret once they give up a song the ones the songwriters i've talked to all sound like they they're totally cool with like they've never had that feeling of regret for giving a song to a different artist because that was not their story to tell I write a song that is incredibly personal to me, which I do from time to time. You know, songwriting is a job to me, but it's also a passion. And so I'll have ideas that I, you know, I don't think could work for anybody else. And and sometimes I'll say, I don't, I don't need this to be for somebody else. I'm going to write it the way that I would write it. And then sometimes I'll use that inspiration and say, I could spin this personal story. You know, if I don't think a song works for somebody else, I won't turn it in. Your own album is is very personal and about your own experiences. So I'm just wondering certain ways that, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering the distinctions between how you approach working on something when you know it's just for you versus you're gonna send it off to someone else. I don't actually do, at, at this point in my career, I don't do a ton of writing for me um, because again, you know, I'm, I'm not in a record deal, you know, so nobody's paying me to just write songs for me, right? Mm -hmm. And so my hustle is to use my time wisely and, and grow my career and my value and my knowledge as a creative songwriter for other people. Um, but, but that record you're, you're talking about um, is from 2018. And that was, if you remember, I, that was when I kind of really got into K-pop. And it was kind of a transitional period for me. It was, I was having a tough time with a lot of things, with my career with my relationships, with my, my mental health. I was actually diagnosed in 2018 with bipolar, um, ADHD, and, um, and high anxiety. And I'm really open about those things. And, and a lot of that record was me coming to terms with that diagnosis, kind of accepting that my career was never going to be perfect, and uh, you know, letting go of the whole relationship element, which is that I don't have control over, over that or, or who or when. And, and so that record was a culmination of a lot of things that I needed to get out of my head. I'm sure that that'll happen again. I'm sure I'll have a lot of, of stuff that builds up. I'm sure I do right now. I have things bouncing around in there that I eventually I'll say, look, I got to get these out of my head. I'm going to take two months. I'm going to write a record for me. Um, but, but in my intentionality, I, I, you know, if I'm sitting down to write, I'm, I'm trying to write something that, could, that the world can love, whether that's my voice or somebody else's. So that album from 2018, uh, it sounds like, that's kind of like a diary entry for a part of history um, that you're not necessarily going to revisit. There's no second album on the way or anything right now. Uh, I'm not going to say no. You know, that, that record's called This is a Journal for a reason. Journal's not closed. You know, I, maybe there'll be a This is a Journal too. I don't know yet. I, you know, like I said, I have, a, I have thousands of songs. 
Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I'll look back at things from a year, two years, three years ago, and, and that hasn't done anything in, in the industry sense. And I'll say, man, this was, I thought this was a good song. Um, you know, I'm going to put this in my short list and maybe eventually I'll find 12 new songs that, that are old songs <laughs> and say like, I'm going to sing these. I'm going to put them out. I think people need to hear this. Well, I would love to know a little more about that album because honestly, I love it. And I do appreciate how open it is. I can personally relate to a lot of it, not to get too personal, but I do appreciate it. And so I guess I'm just wondering, one is kind of how that album came together. If there's any story there about how how that happened, how much you worked on your own versus collaborated to get the album done. And then my second part of the question is just kind of how you were able to um, not just technically get that album out there, but just emotionally, because like when I talk about my anxiety, I already like the second I talk about it, want to like stop <laughs> talking about it. How did you even emotionally like feel ready to do that? I wrote uh, and produced uh, and mixed that entire record myself, except one song. Uh, I, I had um, a friend mix uh, now and then uh, and, and master it. But that, that record was 99.9% me my head and my hands and emotionally and in terms of the, the story and, and wanting to share it again i had just been diagnosed with these mental illnesses and um this is gonna sound crazy but i wasn't scared and i wasn't confused i for the first time in my life i had clarity i had understanding i had knowledge about who i was and why my brain functioned the way that it does for the first time. And, and I'm, you know, I'm, at the time I was 31. And that felt like a triumph to me. I mean, it, it was life changing. It was just this giant relief to me because I thought I was, you know, for the longest time, I thought I was the anomaly. I thought I was the weird, broken, you know, person. And so to talk to a professional, get that diagnosis um, and, and know and then you get treatment for these things. I was just, I was just blown away by how I, I felt. Um, and I, and part of me, I wanted to tell the world, I want everybody to know, you know, that, that finding help and getting, you know, that, that um, treatment for your, for your mental disorders, if you have them, uh, or if you suspect that you have them, you know, that's, that's the best decision you can make because everything that you do is filtered through your mind um, and your brain. And, um, if it's not functioning like maybe it should, then that's going to affect everything you're doing. You enter songwriting sessions now maybe more super, like, I know you said you weren't scared to release that, but now that you have any fears you did have about opening up, like, is it easier to just come as you are into songwriting sessions and, like, be vulnerable as you write songs? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it seems like that would be kind of a, a way to... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Just get more used to uh, no holds barred, just saying how you feel and writing stuff. Because it just, to me, feels, I guess I'm not a songwriter, but to me, it feels so nerve wracking to think about writing personal stuff in a group setting. Yeah. You know, the, the crazy thing, again, about my experience is that I realized through that experience that everybody has their own story, their own journey, and everybody has um, their, own, their own experiences. But by and large, we're all living the same experience in that things aren't easy ever, mm -hmm. ever, you know, and if it is easy, it's because everything you did before it was hard. And knowing that for myself and realizing that that it's not just me changed everything. It changed how I how I write songs, it changed how I collaborate on songs. And when I go into the room with with other artists and writers now, it's a whole lot easier to understand them. And it's my effort is to get on their page. And it's a lot easier for me to do that now. That's that's the best way I can put it. That goes to a bigger point about why you seem to be into writing for artists from all over the world, because music really is such like a universal way to connect with people, I think. There's actually this funny thing, again, part of my technique to songwriting that I that I figured out, um, you know, nobody explicitly taught it to me. Uh, nobody ever really said it to me. I just gathered all the information from my experiences and I came to this point again in about 2018 is the core to getting the world at large um, to love a song. And 
melody, music, instrumentation, production. That's all hugely important. But when you're saying things in a way that people who speak any language can understand it, that's the, that's the key. I mean, that's, that's the answer. Every person, not every person, but, but a lot of the world knows what the English word love means. Look at the amount of songs in the history of music that are about love. You know, I mean, almost every single pop song or K-pop song is about love. And, and it's really easy for people to understand that topic because everybody feels that or wants to feel that. Yeah, it feels like also with just like inflection and how how a song is delivered is universal too. Like everyone kind of gets, if even if they don't speak the language, oh, I'm listening to a really sad song or, oh, I feel that I'm listening to a really happy song, you know? Absolutely. And it's, it's all about, you know, that comes down to sort of the vocal production and the performance. It's funny because there are, I tend to think that there are four kinds of songs. There are happy songs that sound happy, happy songs that sound sad, sad songs. <laughs> sound happy and sad songs that sound sad very true very true and there's not really another there's not another one you know that's basically it you know mm -hmm. um, and people can read that minor key versus major key love versus love lost uh you know what i mean and and like you said the, the way that you sing a certain word can affect how that person receives it whether they understand what you're saying or not i'm curious how um how the past year or so i know 2018 was huge for you but i would I would say probably 2020 was a big transformational year for all of us for more worse reasons than good ones. But has living through the pandemic and everything changed anything about your work? Has it changed maybe just on a technical level how you collaborate or maybe it's changed your outlook and your headspace that has changed your songwriting? I'm just curious how it has shaped your work because some of the songwriters I've talked to have said, now they're really in the mood to write more happy light stuff or they're more into writing darker stuff or they, you know, it, it has changed them. I do music first leave as a passion, but also as a professional. And like I said earlier, I'll, I'll follow whatever is bringing the most, the most opportunity. And, and when I say opportunity, whatever's bringing me the most opportunity to write more songs, because that's what I want money is a side effect of passion and so the opportunity i'm looking for isn't the dollar it's not the it's not the name of the artist it's just the opportunity to make more and so i'm i'm not you know necessarily thinking you know oh my gosh i need to write some happy songs now unless it's for for an artist or or for a publisher or for a tv show you know they're saying okay we do want songs that are happy i'm like okay cool i'll write you a happy song i just love writing songs this thing that changed i think for me was uh, on the production side of my job. I took a lot of time this past year to get better at that. I, I tried to get better at, at mixing. I tried to get better at like, you know, finding the right chord progressions and the right drum sound. You know what I'm saying? Like the technical elements. Right. How to build, once you write the song, how to build the song. That was game changing for me because I wanted to get better at that. But it sounds like songwriting is still the, the favorite. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Production is not, you know, it's not my, it never was my main thing. It's never been my main thing, but again, it is a part of my job. And, um, you know, if I write a song alone, uh, I've got to produce it. Are there any at all, even if it's super, super vague, any spoilers you can share about any song you you're working on right now, or that's about to come out? <laughs> I love it. You know, what's funny. I only get that question from, from K-pop. <laughs> really? Yeah. Because it is, it's funny because there's not really another genre, at least that I've worked on where the fans are so interested in the songs. Very it's, much so. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, I get hit up on Twitter and on Instagram all the time from treasure fans. Just like, just saying, thank you. You know, mm -hmm. I've never had that from, <laughs> you know, none of the Germans are coming to me saying, thanks for that dance song, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. uh, you know, and I love that music and I love doing it, but, but the most great, grateful uh, fan base so far is this incredible uh, K-pop fan base. And um, yeah, I, uh, it's hard to share spoilers, you know, because a they're spoilers, you know, I, I want it to be special. The artist mm -hmm. wants to be special. Um, I like the element of surprise and, and that's really fun to me, but it's also tough because the industry is a little secretive, you know, <laughs> they don't want yeah. people to know what they're doing because 
they want that that big reveal. You know what I'm saying? So it's tough. But I, you know, I'll tell you one thing. I'm I'm working on. I've already written several songs uh, for for an artist uh, on a, on a major record label that um, they're planning a new record and it'll be their second record. And I think people are going to freak out. There's there's one song in particular that. I'm so proud of, and I really hope it makes it to the finish line on the record. Uh, that sounds like a uh, like a doo-wop song, like a '50s American doo-wop mixed with uh, like a like a Justin Bieber. Interesting. Is this a K-pop artist? It is. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So again, it's it's unique. It's different. I, I wouldn't want to say who it is or who it's for because it is wildly different for 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 this artist um, and for K-pop at large. So. Hoping it makes it. If you know, if it does, um, I've told you the info, so you'll know exactly who wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Are you working on several other K-pop songs at the moment? Yeah, yeah. So, um, thankfully, I get I get asked to come in and, and write, you know, lyrics and melodies for other producers who, again, have these great publishers and these great labels that are on their team. And you know, I'm starting to get a little bit of of notability, I guess, uh, for my top lining for these great bands because I understand vocal arrangement and my melodies. I'm always trying to make the best possible version. So um, I'm constantly being sent like tracks, you know, little folders of, of stuff that producers are making and asking if I'll write stuff to it. And yeah, I've got a 15 or 20 tracks on my desk right now that, that are um, that I'm kind of coming in and out and saying, oh, I don't know. I don't really feel this one today, but I don't want to, I don't want to throw it away. So I'll sit on it. Um, yeah. Passively and actively working on a, a bunch of K-pop. Well, that's good to know. So 2021, the rest of 2021 sounds like it'll be a busy Ooh, one. I hope so. I don't know if uh, I don't know if anything quite as big as what this incredible 17 record is doing is going to happen. But fingers crossed. Well, I have two more questions for you. One is, what are do you have any advice for anyone who wants to either get into songwriting or just is an aspiring creative? Maybe they don't want to songwrite professionally and sing professionally, or maybe they do. I don't know. Just any aspiring creative who wants to just, you know, stay true to themselves, what is your advice? I think that if we're talking from from a professional standpoint, like you said, if somebody wants to pursue a career, you know, there's probably two main things I'd say. One is work harder than you've ever worked. If you think you want to do it, you need to do it. You know, you can't just say, okay, I wrote a great song. I think this is the best song. And I'm going to use this as the song for the next six months and, and see if I can get a deal or I can get a cut. You got to write that great song and you have to forget about it. You have to do another great song tomorrow and an even better one the next day. And if you really want to have a career in it, you're going to you're going to have to deal with the fact that no one's going to want you and no one's going to want or believe in you uh, for a long time. And. And uh, that's just that's just a heads up. You know, you're going to want to give up. And and those who don't give up and that keep working uh, are going to make it. There's no question. You're going to make it. You so will stay humble and persistent. It's persistence. Yeah, absolutely. Just keep showing up. Um, and and whenever you get those opportunities, take them um, and then trust your gut. If if what you're working on isn't, you know, what you like and it's not what you think is listenable set it down and move on. Just, just keep on writing. I mean, Ed Sheeran has a great quote. He said, creativity and songwriting is a lot like a garden hose. And if the garden hose is turned off for a long time, the first time you turn it on, there's going to be a lot of gunk and mud and gross water coming out of there. You're not going to want to drink it. But if you keep that hose on, that water starts coming out clear and everybody wants a taste. It's a good analogy. It wasn't me. It was Ed. Good old Ed, <laughs> Eddie Sheeran. Yeah. The second thing, the second piece of advice um, that I would say to people that whether they want to be professional or not, if you want to write songs, just have fun. Have a good time. Mess around. Experiment. Try different sounds. You know, if you make a drum beat out of a kick drum and a snare, try and replace that kick drum with the sound of a banana falling on the floor. You know, like yeah. just get random, get weird and, and experiment and have fun the way your brain tells you you want to have fun when you're writing a song. That may lead to you being the next Lewis Bell, making the next Post Malone record, you know, that that's how that stuff works. My last question for you then is for my listeners who want to know more about the songs you're working on, where can they follow you online? Uh, the main main thing, platform that I use is Instagram. You know, I post stuff on there. I post in my feed maybe like a couple times a month, but I'm always posting stories and 
sharing news. Um, I'm, I'm at Ken Fleet on Instagram. Thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. It was my pleasure. This was great. I'm really, really glad you reached out. This was, this was incredibly humbling, and I really appreciate it. Well, I really appreciate your work and uh, for you uh, reaching back out. So thank you. Of course.